This is Business Weekend with Ross Greenwood. Hi there and welcome to Business Weekend. I'm Ross Greenwood. It is great to have your company today. The $20 billion takeover battle for our second biggest energy company, Origin, ended in a farce this week. A shareholder vote was deferred as the takeover faced defeat. A, the, a new offer, but no more money, was then cobbled together. So what's its future? We speak with one of Origin's biggest shareholders today. Plus, critics of our key corporate cop, ASIC, say it's too slow to prosecute, covers too many areas and should be broken up. Today, we put those claims to the Chairman of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, Joe Longo. I think it's fair to say that since my appointment, the, we have been much more bold, much more ambitious about the cases we take on. And two years ago, electric vehicle charging company Tritium was worth more than $4 billion. Its factories were hailed by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and President Joe Biden. Since then, its shares have fallen 97% and it's teetering. We study what went wrong. Right now, the fact that the stock is at 20 cents tells us investor confidence is sorely lacking. So all that and plenty more coming up on today's program. But look, let's start with Origin Energy. Along with AGL, it's one of the most important companies in this country as an energy generator and as a retailer. Its role in the energy transition is vital, and that will come into focus once its erring coal-fired power station, the largest in Australia, closes in two years' time. Now, for 18 months, Origin has been stalked by the Canadian investor Brookfield and EIG, the American company, for a takeover. They've made no fewer than five takeover attempts so far. This week, shareholders would have vote on their best and final offer, $9.53 a share, worth $20 billion. Directors recommended the offer. It was accepted by the ACCC, but for that bid to succeed, more than 75% of investors had to say yes. But one shareholder, the country's biggest superannuation fund, Australian Super, said no. Not only that, but then bought more shares in Origin and lifted its stake to 17%. It was a blocking stake. It was concerned that long term, a stock market without Origin meant fewer investments for it to share in the rewards that may come from the renewable energy transition. Now, on Thursday, the shareholder vote was deferred. Brookfield and EIG scrambled together a new and even more complicated offer. Australian Super still said no. But if Brookfield does walk away, the Origin Energy share price is likely to fall heavily. So, is Origin too important a company to disappear from our stock market, or is this just another deal? Jamie Hanna is the Deputy Head of Investments and Investment Manager, Van Eck, one of Origin's biggest investors with 5.4 million shares and joins me now. Jamie, many thanks for your time. You are in agreement with this bid, with this new revised offer that's now hit the table. Are you in agreement with that as well? We're certainly in agreement with the existing offer that was on the table as of yesterday. And we certainly, you know, activated our, our vote and said that we were voting for the, the underlying deal. Um, this new deal, however, um, obviously the existing one is still on the table. We're still, uh, you know, for the existing deal. The new one, however, is, is completely more complicated for any shareholder, including likes of ourselves, where they're selling down in multiple tranches with the energy business going to Brookfield and then a separate vote going over to EIG. So th this structure doesn't necessarily work for, for many investors. And there's 120,000 mum and dad investors in, in, in energy in, in the whole entire, um, I guess, uh, industry. So the fact here is that we are still for the deal in its current form, but we're certainly not advocating for a change in the structure at this point. Okay, so just explain to me that, that philosophy about a stock market without origin energy. It, does it make it harder for you as an investment manager to get your share of the energy transition and the rewards that are likely to come from that? Having one less company on the exchange is always... Uh, 
it makes it harder as an Australian investor to express an idea. The likes of Australian Super, however, like for example, they obviously have global operations. Um, our funds that we manage have global operations as well. So it's taking it away, generally speaking, from, from retail investors, an investor who might want to get exposure to it. Uh, institutional investors can source you know, these type of investments offshore. So it's really playing into that hand. That said, I hate seeing companies coming off the stock exchange, good Australian companies. We've seen Sydney Airport go, you know, there is the chance that Origin will go here as well. Uh, the fact is, is yes, it's one less company for Australia, but at the same time, it, anyone's portfolio can be diversified in any different way, being offshore or investing within other companies within Australia. There's still AGL, there are still a number of other companies available. However, if you're the likes of Australian Super, you know, they've got huge capital reserves which they need to deploy within the Australian market. And for them, yes, absolutely, there'll be one less company for them to invest in. Okay, so one of the reasons why the ACCC set aside the competition objections uh, to this takeover was the fact that um, Brookfield had agreed to commit $30 million, uh, $30 billion, I should say, to the energy transition, to accelerate that into the future. And this was seen to be important in the national interest, if you like. And so, therefore, what position do you think Origin is in if this deal does not go through to actually raise that money itself and to actually contribute as Brookfield might have otherwise contributed to that energy transition. There's absolutely no doubt that Origin will need to increase their energy transition targets. At the moment, it's somewhere between three and a half and five gigawatts. Um, Brookfield were coming in at 14 gigawatts and fully funding that themselves. And Brookfield also having all the experience, knowledge and manpower, resources globally to achieve it. So if the deal falls apart, then there is no doubt whatsoever that Origin will have to increase their targets, source new capital to finance that. And Australian Soup has indicated that they could be a source of that funding, but they will have to source it from the market. And in the short term, any form of financing is expensive with interest rates going up. That's the, the you know, companies are no exception to that. So yes, it, uh, it is a much better deal with Origin um, for them to actually, you know, go with Brookfield and hence why they've been recommending it. But Assuming it doesn't go ahead, then, well, they're going to have to change the targets. The board will have to set, set new goals and they'll have to finance it. So all I can say from that point of view is, you know, expect, expect some changes happening at the company. Okay, there's one other truism about all of this, and that is if Australian Super thinks that Origin is such a brilliant investment long term, as you point out, it's got plenty of financial depth. It could buy the company itself. Well, it could, but it's expressing no real desire to do so. Um, you know, they're really just exercising their rights as a shareholder. They're exercising their rights in evaluation. You know, they're operating well within their rights of, of the shareholder on behalf of, like, millions of Australians. So from that respect, you know, Australian super can, can do whatever they want. But will they buy the whole thing and do it? No, I don't think it's within their remit um, to do that. At this point in time, they've certainly expressed no real desire to do that. So I don't imagine that to be, you know, the, the base case for them. They're really looking at it in terms of an equity investment listed on the ASX. So just tell me about this, because the independent uh, advisor to this bid, uh, Grant Samuel, came in with a, a range of prices, uh, a price range rather, whereby it felt it was fair value. When you came to make your own determinations of what was a fair value for Origin, was that a difficult thing to decide, given much of the upside in the energy transition is ahead of the business? Yes, it is. And any form of valuation on a company is completely subjective and it really relies on the inputs that go into it as well as projections of where you think cash flows are coming from. Part of the, the difficulty in valuing, you know, origin is the fact that it looks like Australian super are putting quite a margin onto the octopus energy, the, the British um, energy arm of that. And th there could be some considerable upside, but it's extremely difficult to, to value exactly where that is. And so the independent valuations, our valuations, looking at, you know, not overdoing the octopus side of, 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 the, uh, of the takeover is saying that, well, 
where is fair value? Where is it trading at now? What is good for our shareholders? And we come up to a value around $9.50. So the offer on the table met our expectations. Whereas Australian Super obviously putting a, you know, a higher forecast on where they think those uh, medium to long-term cash projections are going. And that's their prerogative to do so. But look, I mean, at the moment, the share price is trading nearly a dollar below where the offer is. And that's the other reality. If this offer does disappear for whatever reason, the share price of Origin short term, at least anyway, can only go one way, can't it? Well, it's unlikely to go up to the uh, takeover price of $9.50 in the short term, that's for sure, if the deal falls over. It, it's difficult to say how much it will fall, how much takeover premium sitting within that price, but there is certainly some. So the risk will be on the downside to the share price if it falls over. So you mentioned a little earlier Octopus Energy, the, the British energy business that Origin has created, uh, which is actually showing significant growth at this stage. But that's where the complication comes in. With the new bid coming out from Brookfield and EIG, even that business gets sold in what is a bit of a, a roundabout, sort of a, a convoluted fashion. So this is, again, what makes it very difficult for investors to wrap their head around whatever this new deal is. No, absolutely. I mean, the whole new structure of the deal is difficult to understand. It's really playing into the fact that there's a 50% vote required and not a 75% vote required to get it over the line. But then it's a multiple stage project under the new restructured second, second offer. So, look, I mean, you've got to convince the large shareholders or you're trying to avoid Australian super from exercising their rights. It, it, it's going to be a very difficult challenge to get over the line. In its current form, it look, as much as we're voting for it, it doesn't look like it's going ahead. Um, they might be able to work out which shareholders, apart from Australian Super, are voting against it and work on them over the next week or two. However, it, it just looks like an uphill battle to get this deal over the line in its current format or in the proposed one. The Deputy Head of Investments at the Investment Manager, Van Eck, Jamie Hanna, many thanks for your time on the program today. Many thanks for your time on the program today. Thank you. Let's stick with the energy transition. And just 18 months ago, Tritium was the poster child for Australian ingenuity in this area. Would-be Prime Minister Anthony Albanese visited its Brisbane plant in the 2022 election campaign and extolled its tech and its employees. President Joe Biden did the same when Tritium launched its Tennessee plant. Its award-winning electric vehicle charges caused its shares to skyrocket. Its market valuation peaked at more than $4 billion. But then... Things went awry, as Ed Boyd reports. Australian electric vehicle charger maker Tritium is in serious trouble. It's burning through cash, its debt is increasing, and it's just been forced to close its Brisbane factory, resulting in the loss of about 400 jobs. Analysts say Tritium desperately needs to raise capital within the next 100 days to prevent it from taking more drastic measures. The required capital could be as high as 50 million US dollars, which poses a serious challenge for the board when the company's market value is just 33 million US dollars and its recent results showed it has 195 million in debt. Right now, the fact that the stock is at 20 cents tells us investor confidence is sorely lacking. Billionaire backer Brian Flannery, who owns about 5% of Tritium, has reportedly lost patience and is refusing to pump any more money in. Tritium director Trevor St. Baker, who owns roughly 22% of the stock, is reportedly confident the business will survive. About three weeks ago, management released a strategic plan with the goal to turn a profit in 2024. The plan includes improving productivity, closing its Brisbane factory, cutting headcount across the world and focusing its manufacturing on its Tennessee facility. Under any realistic scenario, there will still be a need to you know, raise some additional capital over, over the next uh, six months, you know, maybe 25 to 50 million. And that is uh, you know, larger than the entire market cap of the company today. So naturally, you know, that speaks to the investor fears about whether that capital raise is, is even realistic. The idea for Tritium first came about in 1999 when a group of University of Queensland students dreamt of and then built a car powered by the sun. It was called the Sun Shark. And you watch this, this car you know, drive on the sun only and it's not much more than the power of a toaster. 
And it just makes you think that uh, you know, there was a better way of doing transportation and electrifying transportation. And that really ignited a passion in myself and the other founders to sort of start something to take that technology we developed uh, in that race and take it out to the rest of the world. The Sun Shark came third in the 1999 World Solar Challenge and its secret was a liquid-cooled motor inverter. We'd taken that technology, liquid-cooled technology for motor inverters that is usually reserved for on board the vehicle, and we'd applied that to a stationary electrical equipment, um, which is not normal. And even to this day, we see a lot of our um, you know, traditional established competitors in this space really look at that and go, oh, that looks uh, like something that's a bit too difficult to do. Founded in Brisbane in 2001, Tritium has now sold more than 13,000 electric vehicle chargers in 47 countries around the world. Back in 2021, the growth prospects for the company were huge, so it listed on the US NASDAQ exchange. So that point was reached really very much in 2020, at the start of 2020, and of course that had a huge impact on the business in terms of growth. And what it's really led to is in the last six months we've seen records of sales, we've got record backlog, and we're certainly going to break our revenue record this year in 2021 calendar year. Three weeks after listing in February 2022, US President Joe Biden announced Tritium's plans to open a new factory in Tennessee. The new manufacturing facility of Tritium is, that's announced today is more than just great news for Tennessee. Yes, it's going to create more than 500 good paying jobs in Tennessee, but it's going to deliver greater dignity and a little more breathing room to workers and their families. And it's going to have a ripple effect beyond and far beyond the one state. This generated a huge amount of publicity for Tritium, a few days after the announcement, the share price peaked at $15.70, valuing the company at about 2.7 billion US dollars. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has visited Tritium's Brisbane operation numerous times, most recently seven months ago, when he talked up its potential. This company, Tritium, which has grown in a very short period of time to operate in 42 different countries, it is a growing company in one of the growth industries globally that we are seeing. And the capacity that they have uh, to grow further is just extraordinary. Tritium achieved record revenue in the first half of this calendar year at 112 million US dollars, but it burnt through lots of cash. Its reserve fell from 71 million in June 2022 to just 29 million in June 2023. The cash burn has to slow, otherwise the company may not survive. Analysts say Tritium's customers are now worried about the company's future and its ability to provide warranties and service electric charges well into the future. This is equipment that is designed to last many years and a warranty is a necessary uh, part of the package for any potential buyer, which means the question of Will the company have staying power? Will the company be in business you know, three, five years in the future uh, needs to be considered by any potential buyer. Coming up after the break, Australia's most powerful corporate cop, Joe Longo, chairman of ASIC, answers questions about whether its functions should be broken up and whether it's too slow to prosecute. Thanks for being with us here on Business Weekend. Well, this week, Treasurer Jim Chalmers said he'll create a new set of expectations for one of our key corporate regulators, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. Critics of the agency say its role is too broad and that it's too slow to refer prosecutions to the Commonwealth Department of Public Prosecutions. So what does it take to have an effective corporate cop on the beat? This week, after its annual forum, I sat down with ASIC's Chairman Joe Longo and I started by asking him about the Treasurer new expectations. Uh, so when I was first appointed, the previous Treasurer gave us a statement of expe expectations, which you can see um, on our uh, website. Uh, and the Treasurer announced earlier in the week that uh, he'll be issuing his own uh, statement of expectations in the coming weeks. Uh, but I, I don't see any um, lack of alignment between what the government's concerned about us doing and what we're doing. Uh, you would have noted from the Treasurer's remarks that the priorities of this government are in fact 
ASIC's priorities too, you know, sustainable finance, uh, uh, superannuation, good outcomes for members, uh, cyber risk, the, these are all areas that the government is uh, focused on and we're focused on too. But ASIC's critics would say that your, your, your mandate is too broad, that you can't achieve all the things that you would like to achieve, that perhaps the answer is for ASIC to be broken up. No, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the way ASIC is structured at the moment. It has a long history. Uh, I think it's a reflection of the um, Twin Peaks model. Uh, over the years, uh, successive governments have given uh, ASIC additional um, responsibilities and uh, breadth. And, uh, and I think under the, the way we approach that is a question of best use of resources and prioritisation and focus. And those critics would also point to the referrals to the Commonwealth Department of Public Prosecutions having consistently fallen over the past few years and that being one example as to why ASIC is perhaps not as effective as it should be at bringing corporate criminals to heel. ASIC's enforcement record, particularly since my appointment, has been targeted, it's been bold, it's been ambitious. Uh, I think the record speaks for itself. Uh, the, the referrals issue is a, a, a total misreading of the data. Uh, the, um, the, the number of referrals waxes and wanes with the number of investigations. Uh, and the number of investigations, in fact, has increased uh, the last two years. And so you can expect referrals to the DPP to increase as well. I was going to ask you about corporate behaviour, whether that was any indicator of corporate behaviour, because I know that certainly post the Hain Royal Commission into the banks, there was more activity at that time. But whether you consider that corporate behaviour is better today than what it was, say, five or ten years ago, or whether, in fact, it is a fairly constant sort of situation? Well, there's always going to be uh, work for ASIC to do, for any regulator to do, to maintain high standards of corporate governance and corporate behaviour. Um, but I think any informed observer would say we, there's been a, we did, we're working and living in a very different environment now than pre-Royal Commission. There's been a raft of uh, re regulatory reforms uh, that have been rolled out, the reportable situations regime, the, uh, the DDO regime that deals with the distribution of um, uh, products. And so from my perspective, the um, standards of behaviour uh, in corporate conduct in Australia have certainly not gone backwards and, in my view, probably gone forward. Then take me to one other aspect, because the world is changing very rapidly. Cryptocurrency is one really good example. The, the rise and the growth of superannuation funds poses potentially another opportunity, but risk for Australia as well. This is something that, as a regulator, you've got to be on top of and across before the problems arise. Yeah. Well, as, as you're aware, for 2024, one of our top three priorities is superannuation and dealing with um, encouraging the superannuation funds to higher standards of corporate governance and to make them more member focused and centric in the way in which they're dealing with uh, the interests of members. There's no doubt in my view that there's a long way to go for uh, standards in the superannuation sector to reach community expectations. The other areas, of course, of, of, of fundamental significance of the country are sustainable finance and greenwashing and market integrity. The, the, these are the focus areas for ASIC next year. OK, go back to the superannuation funds. Where is it that they're letting down members in regards to expectations? Well, in a couple of areas in particular, the, in terms of member outcomes, the uh, government, uh, uh, we have a retirement covenant arrangement in Australia, and I think the superannuation funds have, be, have, have to be much more focused on working out how they're going to help members transition from what's known as the accumulation phase to the retirement phase. And we're looking at around three and a half million Australians making that tr transition in the next 10 years. So that's a very, um, that's a very significant and fundamental test of the system. It's time to deliver. Uh, you've got three and a half million people over the next 10 years, it's estimated, uh, will want access to their superannuation. And every person's situation is very different. It's a very personal uh, um, uh, thing to go from working to retirement. And so uh, there's a, f a big financial aspect to that, but there are other aspects as well. Because one aspect of Australia's economy right now is that the number of financial planners is falling dangerously low. 
there are not financial planners stepping up after the Home Royal Commission because many see the barriers as being too high. And it's seen that maybe it's the superannuation funds that need to fill that vacuum. Is that your own sense as well? Well, the, there's, there's clearly a, uh, an issue in Australia with um, unmet financial advice uh, needs, and the government is uh, working on reforms in that very area. So far as superannuation is concerned, that, that we need to um, have a, a regulatory environment that enables the superannuation funds to help their members make informed decisions, well-informed decisions about um, transitioning from accumulation to retirement. So that advice piece and how that looks and how it's going to be regulated uh, is, is really important. A part of the role that, say, ASIC, APRA, the Reserve Bank um, and other regulators take is the stability of Australia's economy. Uh, this week you had your annual forum where you had all of those major regulators together in the same room. Just explain to me the level of cooperation between the regulators trying to address and get ahead of these issues or potential risks in the future that could destabilise the Australian economy. Well, the, we're getting better and better at that. Uh, uh, in the time since I've been chair, I've been really impressed with the way in which in Australia the regulators do cooperate with one another. And you're absolutely right, Ross, earlier in the week we had the ACCC, APRA, the Reserve Bank, ASIC, uh, other regulators uh, in the room talking to one another. And so I think there's a, a, a very strong culture in Australia of cooperation among the regulators. And of course you have the Council of Financial Regulators um, that um, the key regulators sit on, the Treasury sits on. So in terms of financial stability and a common understanding of what issues we're having to deal with, then I think the Australian people are well served uh, from that perspective. So for example, there's a, a very common understanding of the issues we're facing with sustainable finance, with, with greenwashing, uh, with um, artificial intelligence, for example, uh, the, the crypto, the, the, all of these problems, uh, an ageing population, all of these problems are the subject of a collective discussion and understanding among the regulators. Because a part of ASIC's role is also education educating the community about risks that might be out there, about scams, about a range of different areas. But as you look forward, given interest rates have risen so far, do you see that there are risks coming for individuals and for businesses as a result of those rapidly rising interest rates? Well, I think the interest rate uh, problem, the, the question of inflation, the Reserve Bank and Michelle Bullock has been, you know, been saying a lot about that. The, where, where we see the cost of living and interest rates playing a really um, a significant role for many Australians is um, uh, be having access to affordable uh, uh, accommodation and predatory lending. There, there are a lot of Australians who are, are frankly the victims of a very aggressive predatory lending practices and that's actually an enforcement priority uh, for us next year. Uh, even the humble subject of car insurance um, many Australians are uh, uh, being victimised by uh, um, practices in that area. So where we see our role is, is consumer protection in financial services and, and the current uh, high interest rate environment and inflationary environment is really uh, putting a lot of pressure on Australians and we see that uh, in these other uh, activities. One point in your priorities for the coming year was really about the fact that you are prepared to take legal action against anybody in this country if they do wrong. And you're also prepared to go to court with the prospect of not winning. Is that a change in attitude, a change in behaviour inside our corporate regulator? I think it's fair to say that since my appointment, the, we have been much more bold, much more ambitious about the cases we take on. Have you learnt that from the ACCC? We are, now that you've mentioned the ACCC, uh, we are the most active law enforcement agency in the country. The most active. We're in court every business day of the year somewhere in the country. So I think my answer to your question is yes, we are more in fact, more litigious uh, than the ACCC when you actually look at the number of cases we bring. So the ACCC can speak for itself. We have a, a, a different uh, jurisdiction and mandate. Um, all I ask is for people to actually 
see what we do. This week alone there's a major continuous disclosure case being run in the federal court. We've had results in the criminal court. We had uh, Mercer uh, penalised yesterday for over $12 million. At last Friday charges were laid arising out of the Sterling Income Trust in Western Australia. That's just in the last seven days. Um, so I am absolutely confident that uh, you will see even more enforcement from ASIC uh, in the next 12 months. The only other thing I would say is uh, that the, we are very strategic. So the priorities that we have announced earlier this week are intended to make a clear signal to the market as to where we think the problems are. Those problems and issues that we're uh, dealing with we, we didn't just make those up for ourselves. Uh, that, that, that reflects a very um, deep engagement with consumer groups, with uh, the banks, with the general community. It, it, it reflects our analysis of all the data we get from the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. So the, the key for us is to be very focused and strategic with our use of resources so that when we do take court action, it has a deterrent impact. And it, and it affects as many people as possible beneficially. Joe Longo, good to chat to you. Many thanks for your time today. OK. At some time in most people's lives, we either start up a small business or we dream of setting one up. The sad reality, though, is that most people fail. The dream of riches from the spark of a great idea drives us. But conventional wisdom shows that 90% of startups fail. The good ideas never amount to much. Even if you get through the first year, the most dangerous year, then 70% of businesses fail between years two and five. So what makes Tesla's Elon Musk, Amazon's Jeff Bezos, Microsoft's Bill Gates, or in Australia, Twiggy Forrest, Melanie Perkins, or Mike Cannon-Brooks different from the rest of us? Well, that point's been occupying the mind of Paul X. McCarthy, adjunct professor and industry fellow at the University of New South Wales. And I spoke with him earlier this week. We started on this journey, Ross, about five years ago. We had a piece of, of research published which showed for the first time that all jobs have personalities. So this was published in a prestigious US journal uh, known as the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where we looked at uh, around 100,000 people, um, the personality of 100,000 people, and, and that they all had different jobs, and that the jobs themselves had personalities. So this led to a follow-on question, a special type of job being an entrepreneur, are entrepreneurs different to employees? And what did you discover? Are they different? Is there something fundamentally different in their personalities or in maybe the things that drive them as compared with the people who might start a business and then fail at that business? Absolutely, Ross. So we found by looking at detailed personality profiles of over um, 20,000 entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs worldwide, um, there is, there's clear um, differences in personality and we trained a we used artificial intelligence and machine learning to to train a predictor to distinguish between successful entrepreneurs and successful employees with over 80 percent success so it just means that basically personality is one of the key key distinguishes that people are different entrepreneurs are different well they're risk takers we recognize that but what element does luck play in this as well? I mean, you know, very determined people, uh, inventors and entrepreneurs, these types of people, but to actually make success, it, does luck play a part in their, in, their, in their own lives as well? Absolutely. You don't ever rule out luck. Luck is an important um, part of anyone's success. What this study tells us is that uh, having a, an entrepreneurial type personality increases the probability of your success by as much as 10%. Um, we found that um, there was not one particular type of personality that was suited to entrepreneurship, but there were a range of um, six types of entrepreneurial personalities. Um, we estimate, by the way, that only about 8% of people in the, in the general population are these uh, entrepreneurial types. Um, and there are, yeah, six different types. So there are six types of personalities you mentioned there. There are leaders, there are accomplishers, there are operators, developers, fighters and engineers. Of those yes. types of personalities, which would you prefer to be if you are most likely to get success? That's a really interesting question. Uh, and what we found is that 
it's a combination of personalities that produce the, 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 the greatest chance of success. So whatever you do, when you're starting a business, more founders uh, leads to greater probability of success. But we found that not only that diversity of the personality types within the foundation team was the greatest predictor of success. Um, there's a there's a kind of a um, apocryphal tale of the hacker, the hustler, and the hipster, which was actually coined by an Australian expat in the tech scene in California. Um, and this idea that there are three types of people that you need to form a successful tech company. Um, and we found evidence for this um, at scale that there are indeed different types of combinations of personality is, the be is your best chance of success. Because when you think about it, any entrepreneur needs to convince investors to put money in. They then need to convince bankers to actually come behind them. They need the best people to actually do it. And they need to keep all those balls in the air while that business is losing money. So, so many of these tech entrepreneurs have been able to convince their stakeholders to stick with them until they eventually find the, the success in terms of cash flow. And that's no different today as it might have been when Bill Gates was setting up Microsoft some 30 or 40 years ago. Absolutely. Yes, you need that tenacity um, as well as the adventurousness. Um, one of the interesting things we found is adventurousness was the key. While, while there's a pattern of uh, personality, detailed personality features associated with each of these different types, adventurousness was the, one of the key key drivers. And yeah, it's interesting to observe that um, some famous entrepreneurs like um, Richard Branson, for example, are very interested in adventure sports. You see also the founders of Canva uh, and their, uh, you know, in interesting kite surfing. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that are into motor racing or climbing. And this correlation with, uh, you know, interest in adventure is quite interesting. It, adventure means also a preference for novelty. So it's a kind of a, some people prefer routine and being able to do the same thing. This is common with elite athletes. Elite athletes are not like uh, tech entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. Um, they, they are willing to do the same job and perfect that, you know. So um, if you're an elite tennis player, um, you, you prefer routine over novelty whereas um, entrepreneurs won't do the same thing twice. The interesting part about that is, you know, in their endeavours, they're risk takers. So that's what we're really observing here. But then there's one other observation, and that is quite often entrepreneurs who might even get across the first hurdles and set up a successful business. Then if they become a public company, they're not very good at running that company. In, in many cases, they fail at actually running a larger organisation because they're not organised. Yeah, that's right. And that's where this combination team effect really kicks in. So you see some um, leaders and accomplishers in particular, you know, that end up being the kind of um, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Michael Bloomberg, these types of people that have... Um, they're very um, stable in their personalities. They have very low anxiety and they're willing, you know, they're able to kind of um, uh, exude a lot of confidence um, and a lot, provide a lot of stability for investors and large teams. So, therefore, does this research, should it be putting people off becoming entrepreneurs and trying to have a go with that great idea? Or do you give a sense that it's a, a dose of reality to actually make people understand if you are going to have your great startup idea, you'd better be pretty driven to make certain you can achieve success and not lose money? I think one of the key lessons is that uh, the opportunity for collaboration. I mean, one of the key lessons from this is personality diversity is probably the, the trump card in starting any new venture. Many thanks for your time. Paul X. McCarthy, adjunct professor and industry fellow at the University of New South Wales. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Coming up after the break, now this has been coming for some time, the Fair Work Commission starts cracking down on workers who won't come back to the office.
It's great to have your company here on Business Weekend. Now, if you have workers who are still not willing to come back into the office, there's some good news. The Fair Work Commission has started to tighten the rules about when and how a boss can order workers to leave home and go back to the office. But there's something else that's also quite obvious. As labour markets tighten and as companies seek to cut back, then those who are hidden from sight at home are more likely to lose their jobs first. Joining me now, Jessica Tinsley, General Counsel and Director of Workplace Relations at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Jessica, many thanks for your time. Go first to the Fair Work Commission and the way in which it's now tightening up some of these rules about who can stay at home and who needs to go back to the office. Mm. Well, thanks for having me, Ross. So I, I guess in terms of the, the Fair Work Commission decisions that we've seen, we've seen a couple of them over the last couple of weeks, um, they're really welcomed by employers um, on this issue. So we know that employers, when they can offer working from home arrangements, um, we know that they're doing that. However, uh, increasingly since the pandemic, we know that employees are starting to drag their feet back to the office environment. Um, and we know that there's been a, an impact on this from working from home on productivity. Um, so, and this is what this Fair Work Commission really said. So it's talking about the link there between um, the fact that if you're working from home all the time, um, that you're not getting that mentorship, you're not getting that face-to-face um, -face interaction, you know, you're not even getting that, that social interaction with colleagues, which the, the Commission, early days in, in terms of some of these decisions, but um, certainly are heading in the right direction and a welcome um, intervention from our Workplace Tribunal. OK, so in this particular case, it was about a father, a single father, who needed to care for his child. But there are other cases where the Fair Work Commission says it's reasonable for a person to work from home and unreasonable for an employer to order them back to the office. Just explain the distinction between those two. Hmm. So I think in terms of there's a there's a few different layers here. We know under the Fair Work Act that there's a right to, to request flexible work. Um, so for those with caring responsibilities, however, they're the, um, the, the and this is what those that decision last week was really talking about um, in terms of we had a father caring, uh, wanting to care for his son. Um, however, he was looking to care for his son full time. Um, sorry, part of, the, part of the time, but work from home full time. So the commission rightfully stepped in and said, well, hang on a second, um, you're only part caring for your son a part of the time, why do you need to work from, from home the whole time? So we've got th that protection um, within our laws. However, for everyone else, um, what we're saying is, uh, you know, that the, unless you've got a caring responsibilities, unless you um, have some other reason why you need to be working from home, it's really up to the for individual employers um, to be deciding what works best for them and their workforces. Uh, and I think that's really... That, that common sense approach, that discussion between the employer and the employee is where we really need to be having the majority of those conversations. And what's quite obvious is that uh, working from home has allowed flexibility in the workplace. Um, and so long as it works for both parties, then it does provide the ultimate, you know, in terms of being able to care for children or care for um, elderly parents, whatever it might be. But then on the other side of it, there is also a point at which an employer is within their rights to say to an employee, no, we actually need to see you around the place. We need to see you for certain functions that we require this job to be in the office. Mm, absolutely. You're completely right there, Ross. And this is what we're, we're seeing with these early Fair Work Commission decisions. Again, they'll always be considered case by case, um, depending on the individual circumstances. Uh, but really, uh, I think what we're, we're starting to see here is um, you know, the, the Commission saying that employers do have the right, um, there's reasonable business grounds for you to be back in the office. We need you there, not just for your own mentorship, um, for your own training, but also for passing on that knowledge, that wisdom to more junior members of staff. We're really starting to see that link between workplace productivity and working in the office. Um, so when uh, employers are, are telling their, their employees um, to, to come back to the office after the pandemic, which has been, you know, it was a while ago now that we're all working from home full time as a result, well, for those of us that were lucky to be able to do that, um, employers aren't being mean. At the end of the day, there, there's, there really is um, a reasonable business grounds, links to productivity of why we need more people back in the office.
OK, so then take me to one other aspect of this, because I wonder whether this might end up before the Fair Work Commission as well. And that is we now see labour hire intentions starting to weaken. Um, and we know, say, for example, the Reserve Bank, Treasury um, and many others see the Australian unemployment rate going from 3.7 perhaps out to 4.5%. That being the case, if employers are looking through their workforce and saying, well, OK, who is actually not necessarily around the place? Who's not productive? Some of those at home may very well be amongst those that are let go or retrenched. Is that going to lead to more cases before the Fair Work Commission, do you imagine? I think certainly. I think this, this is a, a tension that will um, continue to arise in workplaces and that as we start to see more of those decisions, I can certainly see um, d a conflict in, in this way. Um, I think in terms of uh, we know that there is a link between working from an office environment and workplace productivity. So if we have, if we continue to see employees dragging their feet back into the office, we know that that does have an impact on workplace productivity. And what do we know about uh, business that are unproductive, um, they have to they have to reduce their their operations. They have to start to let people go. Um, so I think you're entirely right there, Ross. We, this will be a, a growing issue. So one aspect of this is many employers do not want to go to the Fair Work Commission under any circumstances. They generally figure that it, it might be stacked against them or whatever it might be. But this is one area where employers need to watch the Fair Work Commission because it's setting policy right now that clearly could determine how and when they can let workers go in the future. Mm. So I think in terms, I think it's certainly right. Although in saying that, I think we do need to, to keep in mind that the, the Commission will consider these issues case by case. Um, but there's certainly some trends and, and early signs are that the Commission is recognising that you need to be in the office at least some of the time in, in most cases. So that certainly is welcome. Um, I think a, another point that's worth noting there, Ross, is that the fact that, that the government um, introduced these the ability for the Commission to arbitrate these matters as part of their reforms at the end of last year. So we've always, for a long time, we've had the right to request flexible work if you've, say, got caring responsibilities, etc. Um, but it was the, the government changes last year that meant that uh, an employee can um, ask to, to work full time from home. No, regardless of how um, practical or how common sense that was. And under these new laws, we're seeing um, employees being able to drag their employer um, before the, the workplace tribunal uh, in these really common sense circumstances. So I think the business community remains concerned that we are going to see more of these and the cost that that's going to place on businesses, especially small businesses that really can't have their, their management decisions um, in consultation with, with their employees, um, getting uh, pushed off to the, the Fair Work Commission and decided by, by a third party. I'll tell you what, Jessica Tinsley, good to have you on. This is going to be contentious, there's no doubt, because you can see what's coming down the track already from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Many thanks for your time today. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for the program this Sunday. Up next, all the latest news right here on Sky News. Business Weekend returns next Sunday, but of course, you can keep up to date with all the latest business news with our daily program, Business Now, 4.30pm Eastern Time, and also our website, skynews.com.au. Thanks for your company today. I'm Ross Greenwood. We'll see you next week.